Thank you for coming to this Nordic semester presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Marin Anderson Johnson, who is an assistant professor and director of Nordic studies at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, which is an eight and a half hour drive from Joplin. And Dr. Johnson and I explored flying her in and just didn't uh, work out. It, she would have spent more time uh, driving to an airport and, uh, than she would have driving. So uh, thank you for, for giving up uh, two full days on the road almost. Uh, Luther is the oldest college founded by Norwegian immigrants in the United States. Uh, Luther College has, a, has an enrollment of about 2,000 students in a town of 8,000 population. The Nordic Studies Department at Luther is home to a variety of courses on Nordic language, literature, and lifestyle. The topics range from the works of Henrik Ibsen to contemporary Nordic television, which you're going to hear about today. Our speaker received her MA and PhD in Scandinavian language and literature from the University of Washington. She completed her dissertation at the Ibsen Center at the University of Oslo in Norway. She is originally from Seattle. Dr. Johnson has near native fluency in Norwegian and advanced high proficiency in French. She also has advanced proficiency in Swedish and Danish and reading knowledge of German. So if you're counting along, that's five different languages in addition to English. Dr. Johnson is giving three presentations at Missouri Southern today, uh, one more after this one at one o'clock. This one is titled Norway and Netflix, Exporting Norwegian Culture Through TV. So please give Dr. Johnson a round of applause. Got the mic to work. Does it all sound okay? Go on there. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for being here this afternoon over the lunch hour. <laughs> I know this is coveted um, campus time, the 12 to 1 o'clock uh, lunch hour. This afternoon, I am going to spend about the next 35 minutes uh, talking about Norway and Netflix um, and exploring some of the themes and uh, ideas behind some television shows from Norway that are currently available on Netflix. Now, why? Why Norway and Netflix? First of all, I must confess that a talk on Norway, or is of course part of my professional and personal interest, but a talk about Netflix has a lot more to do with personal interests. Um, I have to say I'm an incredibly fond TV consumer um, and have been for most of my life. So um, I, this project and this talk today comes from both professional and personal interests um, for today. So to begin with, we're gonna, uh, most of us in this room are aware of the power of Netflix and also the proliferation of TV even in the last five years. Netflix has been a forum for hosting some of the great cult favorite television shows, The Office, Friends, uh, Gilmore Girls, and also because it has become a producer of some of the world's most acclaimed television series. This past week, if any of you are award show uh, fans, Amazon Prime's The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, if any of you have watched that, just made a giant flash at the Emmy Awards, um, earning, I believe, five Emmy wins, and stunning the show stunned and challenged the hegemony of our major network television providers such as ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS. And now while Netflix's producers and executives were probably frustrated with Maisel's win as it doesn't, wasn't one of their shows, the producer of this series is also a Netflix client, Amy Sherman Palladino, who is also known as the creator of the cult series Gilmore Girls which infamously two years ago had its reboot, a four episode reboot exclusively on Netflix. So for a TV lover like myself, the early days of Netflix provided the great token of accessibility. 
in a way that broke the bonds of cable. But in the years since, as my professional career has developed both as a teacher and a scholar, Netflix has also shared an, another exceptional gift. And for somebody who studies a part of the world that is not easily accessible, um, especially on the internet, because we don't want to buy, we don't want to do anything illegal with wireless routers or anything, um, television shared across international and national boundaries was now part, is now part of our accessibility. That we don't need to worry about regions. We don't need to worry about DVDs or even a time zone. As a language professional, Netflix provides accessibility for me, for my students, and um, many others to contemporary cultural products to tell and to television that is viewed simultaneously in Norway and for us in Decora, Iowa, or here in Joplin, Missouri. This platform allows for us to have a more real-time interaction with Norway in a way that only is afforded by the internet. So today, I will focus on three series that are currently on Netflix that are Norwegian productions or collaborations between Norwegian co companies and other international actors. And my aim for this time that we are together here this afternoon is not to provide a detailed analysis of these shows or to highlight certain specific characters or conduct a very intense literary analysis, but rather to highlight some of the narrative trends, to think about how these series shape and their role in shaping the inter international perception of Norway today and how they provide a lens into Norway for international audiences. So to begin, it's important to talk a little bit about Netflix itself. The way we consume media has dr changed dramatically in the last decade. Netflix itself, some of you may remember, others might not, that it actually started as a DVD subscription service where streaming was not part of the equation. But the new modes of Netflix consumption where we have it on our tablets, our phone, our devices at all times, means that accessibility is no longer a question. As such, online streaming challenges the previous models of television viewing, where we needed to schedule a communal practice to sit down and watch a television show. There was a day where you had to sit down to schedule for 30 minutes to watch an episode of TV, and it would not be available on DVR, TiVo, all sorts of other sources. The demand for this TV was driven by the fact that one could not use on demand. You had to sit and watch the show at the assigned time, and now you, the consumer, you determine the schedule, the content, and the community with which one engages in TV. Between 2014 and 2017, Netflix almost doubled its number of subscribers to 100 million worldwide. Uh, as of April 2018, they'd actually grown again to 125 million global viewers. Part of this ability to grow from a streaming service to a major competitor in the television markets has been because they've been able to establish their own TV series that gives them unique content. In 2018, early this year, Netflix CEO David Wells announced that the company would spend upwards of $8 billion in the production of original content this next year and that in the neighborhood of 700 original series would now be available on Netflix. Of those 700, 80 of them are non-English language productions from around the world. So why? Why Netflix and why now? First, possibly just the prevalence of viewing devices. If I think about my own purse right now, I probably have three devices in which I could actually engage with Netflix. A laptop, an iPad, and a phone. That's terrifying. The 18 to 24 year old market has of course been really driving this. Secondly, this question of original content and Netflix's original content. Uh, series such as Fuller House, The Crown, Orange is the New Black, Stranger Things. These shows are oftentimes independently produced and deal with subjects and or themes that are more controversial or ap appeal to certain niche audiences. The reboot of the series Full House that ran from 87 to 95 demonstrates an attempt to draw in the millennial generation to a show that was a cult classic and the favorite. So these alternate providers, Netflix, 
Hulu, YouTube are providing new platforms and new modes for television producers to circulate their material. But then the question, of course, is for a Nordic semester at Missouri Southern, how does Netflix, this phenomena, connect to the Nordic region, and in this case, to Norway? Netflix has been a pioneering platform also for Norwegian TV, for a country that has rarely ever made a splash <laughs> with its TV production. Norway finally has a platform to display some of their really great shows. Historically, Norway has never been a, a powerhouse in either film or television because of both population control, uh, population issues, um, and just quantity. Until the Winter Olympics in 1994, when Lillehammer, when Norway hosted the Olympics, Norway only had one national television network. Until 1994, they had one television network. And in 1994, the government decided, this is great, let's get two television networks <laughs> in order to host all of the sporting events so everybody had access to them. So there has always been a very concerted historical effort to control the production of media and control the production of TV in Norway. In the 1950s, when the, with the advent of the television, the Norwegian government actually stepped in and decided that they would become the ones that would regulate who, when, how for all issues of TV. That led to some very conservative decisions to the point at which for a couple of decades, television was only available from 4.30 to 9 p.m. at night. And then the network would get shut off. So they, um, they, it is um, since then, since 1994, the network, team, the television network um, market in Norway is actually still relatively pitifully small, at only about seven to eight channels, um, and about half of those channels are still associated with the national broadcasting company NRK, or Norges Rikskringskasting. It's a good. There will be a test on that word at the end. <laughs> Um, in the Nordic context, Denmark and Sweden have traditionally been the powerhouses when it comes to film and TV. Uh, the Danish series Borgen, which is a political drama following the election of Denmark's fe a, Den a female prime minister in Denmark, has, a has achieved incredible amounts of international notoriety. Denmark and Sweden have traditionally been powerhouses because of their proximity to continental Europe. They share a border. Um, Denmark shares a border with continental Europe, um, but also Sweden has a larger population and m much more accessibility to arts funding and uh, they've supported that industry much more uh, than the Norwegian government has. So when logging into Netflix in 2013, I now all of a sudden noticed an upsurge in the number of available Norwegian shows on this platform and it caused me to stop for a minute to pause and think about what the role of this internet distributor is and how it's becoming an important platform for the de dissemination of Norwegian TV around the world. <laughs> so what do the Norwegian shows that I'm going to talk about today have to do or what do they contribute to Norwegian or to international audiences? The three shows I'm going to show you clips of and also talk about raise questions, I argue, about cultural sustainability and the endurance of our current modes of globalization and media consumption. In the next few minutes, I'm going to outline three of them and, uh, that are either Norwegian productions alone and then just disseminated through Netflix or are collaborative productions that deserve greater attention and hopefully this will provide some recommendations for your Netflix queue in the next few weeks but no binge watching, at least until after all your coursework and other work is complete. So the first show I'm going to talk about is one called Lily Hammer. And yes, that is, a correct mis that is not the correct ta spelling of the geographic location in Norway. It is intentional that this show is called Lily Hammer. This is actually, I'm going to uh, let you know, this is a show that sparked my interest in Norwegian TV and Netflix. Premiering in 2012, this show is probably the most well-known of the three that I'm going to talk about today. The show ran for se three seasons and finished in 2014. Lily Hammer, the show Lily Hammer, was the brainchild of this man, Stephen Van Zandt. Now, Stephen Van Zandt may also be known for other 
careers that he has had in the United States. Uh, primarily, he is the guitarist for Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. And secondly, he was also an, a series regular on the HBO, shit, HBO hit The Sopranos. In the 1980s, Van Zant landed in Norway. And he claims that while in Norway and coming in to land among the fjords, he, told, he leaned over to Bruce Springsteen and he claims he had never seen a place so beautiful before. And this started his quest that lasted for almost three decades to figure out how to work again in Norway. This is a series that chronicles the life of a New York mob boss, Frank the Fixer Tagliano, as he leaves his role as mob boss in New York City and enters the Witness Protection Program. Tagliano claims that the US is no longer safe for him, so he elects to relocate to Lillehammer, Norway. And he assumes a new identity as Giovanni Henriksen, or Johnny, Johnny Henriksen. His decision to move to Lillehammer, he claims, is motivated by the glorious Norwegian landscape he saw during the 1994 Olympics. It all connects together. The show chronicles his challenges of transitioning from being a mob boss to trying to be an average member of Norwegian society. His Transition, however, does not go very smoothly because within the first episode, he decides he wants to own a nightclub. And alcohol is so regulated in Norway to the point at, that you have to get special permits and permission actually by the central authorities in Oslo to sell alcohol. And of course, that puts a red flag in any immigration file. Who is this Giovanni Henriksen? So besides being part of Netflix's cadre of success, Lillehammer is actually one of the most uh, successful television shows in Norwegian history. When it premiered in January of 2012, uh, 998,000 people tuned in to watch the premiere episode, which is actually about 57% of the Norwegian TV market. So over half. And that also is one-fifth, a little bit under one-fifth of the entire Norwegian population. Season two debuted in October 2013 with similar viewership. And, 2000, and in 2014, season three began with a dramatically smaller audience. Each season premieres in Norway before being made public to an international audience through Netflix. The reason for decline in viewership over the three seasons are varied, and we're not going to talk about that today. But one challenge in analyzing the show and how Netflix and its relationship to Netflix is that Netflix does not make ratings available. Netflix does not release viewership statistics. So whenever you're going to talk about a show, a Netflix, either, either a distribution or an original series, Netflix is very close lip about their, um, their viewership statistics. The other interesting thing about this show, and it is important to note, is that this is actually the first Netflix original content that ever existed. Lilyhammer is the first show that, Nor that Netflix said, this is our original content. Now, is it completely original for them? No, but it is the first streaming show that they offered as original content. The show, in its three seasons, failed to attract major audiences, um, and so it be partially because it became more progressively more violent and it began to engage with significant social discussions about immigration in Norway. The show was canceled in 2014 by the Norwegian producers after the cost, debate about cost of continuing to produce the show. Van Zandt was noticeably, as you can imagine, disappointed by the decision. But as he tweeted, after the decision was made, RIP, not my decision. Let's just say for now, the business got too complicated. Very proud of our 24 shows, new ideas on the way. So for a small teaser of Lilyhammer, we are going to watch the, uh, the trailer for season one. I got some demands. 
I think you're in Lilyhammer. You give us Aldo DeLucci, and we'll send you to the goddamn North Pole. Why the f*** do you want to go there? Didn't you see the Olympics in 94? Clean air, fresh white snow, gorgeous broads. It was beautiful. Uh, you must be the new neighbor. Giovanni Hankinson. <laughs> oh, you're in the postal service. I'm chief of police. OK. You got me living in the project next to the chief of police, driving a sewing machine. I gave you Aldo f***ing Bellucci. What are you doing out here by yourself? Where you going? Come here! Not too much, much jobs, but pizza delivery. Ma? You know, I had a very successful bar in New York. To start a bar is a, is a, is a very complicated bureaucratic process. Take care of whoever you gotta take care of. New beginnings. So, a small teaser. My apologies about the language. The second show that we're gonna, I'm gonna highlight today is one called Kumpen um Tumtvonne, or The Heavy Water War. This is one of the newest releases on Netflix from Norway. Debuting in 2015, this show on its Norwegian debut aired to a record 1.2 million people in Norway. Throughout the first season, the viewership statistics also demonstrated only increased interest in the show. This is a mini-series, a nine-part mini-series, that is a collaboration of, between uh, companies from Britain, Headline Pictures, Danish collaboration, Norwegian, and NRK, the National Broadcasting Network in Norway. The series is also distributed by a Swedish company, so it is a multinational collaboration. After the premiere in Norway in January, and it premiered in Denmark in May 2015, and in 2015, in June of 2015, in the UK. The show is set, as you might be able to guess by its, uh, by its poster, during the, day, uh, during the German invasion of Norway during World War II, with special emphasis on the, June, the German nuclear weapon project and the Norwegian efforts to disturb the work on this project. The title, Kampen om Tungtvane, means the heavy water war. It refers to the strong battle to prevent the Germans from accessing heavy water, an ingredient that was deemed necessary in one of the methods to make an atomic bomb during World War II. It was a resource that was highly coveted by the Nazis and one of the reasons that Hitler decided to invade Norway during World War II. Norway was invaded for five years and it was under occupation and the battle for Norway was disastrous. The 1948 movie, Heroes of Telemark, starring iconic American actor Kirk Douglas, highlights a similar story about a group of Norwegian saboteurs who tried to sabotage the heavy water plant in Rukom in Telemark. This series then, in a way, is a remake of the story and it tries to bring back into focus the heroics of a group of young Norwegian men who were trying during World War II to do anything to fight against the Nazi aggressors. Two important things to note on this series. First, it focuses on four narrative lines. It focuses on the sabotage from the line of the Norwegian saboteurs, the allied forces who were controlling much of the invasion for, of, the, um, of, the, of the contest from the Norwegian side in the UK, the company, that produces heavy water, and from the perspective of the Germans, the German Nazis who are trying to access this resource. Secondly, the show focuses on one Norwegian in particular, 
the life of a man named Leif Trunstad, who was a Norwegian scientist and member of the Norwegian resistance movement. He was a professor of chemistry and was very involved in early research on heavy water. After the invasion of Norway in 1940, Trunstad actually traveled to England to help conduct resistance efforts from the UK. The show constructs a very clear hero narrative around this character, celebrating Trumstad for his work not only as a militant, but also as an exceptional mind, someone who is exceptional above the rest. In this way, the show glorifies the struggle and challenges of World War II, a common practice that we see happening a lot when we get to the work of memorializing or essentializing a time in history. So here is a small clip from the first episode to give you a teaser for this show. Meine Damen und Herren, Professor Heisenberg. Guten Abend. Ein energieproduzierender Reaktor wird sekundär auch Plutonium produzieren, das sich hervorragend als Bombenmaterial eignen wird. Diese Bombe, von der Sie da sprechen, die eine gesamte Stadt innerhalb von Sekunden zerstören kann, Wie groß ist die Stadt, von der Sie da sprechen? Wie groß ist die Stadt, die Sie treffen möchten? London. <lacht> um London zu vernichten, benötigen Sie eine Bombe in der Größe... in der Größe einer Ananas? Meine Damen und Herren, Londons Untergang. creating an atomic bomb. Werner Heisenberg, Nobel Prize winner. We still don't know how far they've got, but with this new order for five tons of heavy water, we have every reason to fear the worst. Heisenberg considers the heavy water essential for his bomb project. They're gonna produce heavy water, they're gonna get the bomb, and that's gonna be it. The world will end as we know it. The target is the heavy water factory at Rukar. The third show that I am going to talk about today and talking about issues of cultural sustainability is one that if you were here for the first lecture, you saw a clip of. In 2015, the second television network in Norway, which is creatively named TV2, or TV2, uh, debuted. Uh, this show debuted in October of 2015, and on January 2016, this show debuted excuse me, premiered on Netflix. The creator and mastermind behind this eco-critical imaginary narrative is Yu Nespe, the most well-known Norwegian crime fiction author. In this series, he imagines the world if the Green Party had just won the election in Norway on a platform of converting all of Norwegian uh, energy sources to renewables. In this, he decides that Norway will turn off its oil supply and gas production in favor of more cleaner, renewable sources, one of which he sees in the element of thorium, deriving its name from the Norse god, Thor. This, crea this action creates an outcry from Norway's neighbor in the north, the Russians, who promptly kidnap Norway's prime minister, and action unfolds as Norway, primarily the city of Oslo, deals with an ever-increasing Russian presence to pressure the Norwegian government to return to oil production. It is perceived that the European continent and Russia will fall into major en energy crisis if Norwegian oil is not produced again. The episodes now available detail both the government and civil unrest that occurs with growing frustration about the Russian presence in Norway while Russia's control of the Norwegian gro government grows stronger. This series is a co-production between Arte, the French and German TV network, and in collaboration with the Swedish studio behind the famous girl with the dragon tattoo, Yellowbird. 
With a production budget of almost $11 million, this is the most expensive Norwegian television production to date. Whereas Lilyhammer was a collaboration with Norway's public service broadcaster, NR Cole, this series was run and produced by TV2, the network that finally came to reality in 1994. Tensions arose in 2013 over the production of the show and the cost of production overreached what anybody in Norway was really willing to spend. Therefore, they went to international producers to aid in the completion of the project. There's a desire in Norway to produce highly celebrated, critically acclaimed television shows, but at what cost? How much money really should be spent in the television industry? This series, as you can imagine from the brief plot synopsis, has not been free from controversy. The Russian embassy in Oslo actually released a direct statement about this show um, from the official Russian news agency, TASS, after the show premiered. The press release said, quote, though the series authors try to stress that this is a fictional plot that supposedly has nothing to do with reality, this film debuts with perfectly real countries, and unfortunately, Russia is cast in the role of aggressor. It is, a cert is certainly a shame that in the 70th anniversary of the victory of World War II, the authors have seemingly forgotten the Soviets' heroic contribution to the liberation of northern Norway from Nazi occupiers decided in the worst traditions of the Cold War to scare Norwegian spectators with the non-existent threat from the East. Take that as you will. Nesbø, the author of the series, has responded to this criticism, as have producers, claiming that when the idea for the series first originated in 2008, it really was a fictional circumstance. The possible Russian aggression and frustration with the show stems from the more recent military actions and more struggle and struggles by the Russian government, especially in Eastern Europe. So here's a small preview of this show from its first season. What happens if we all stop using fossil fuel today? We're really helping by creating a sustainable, climate-friendly energy source for ages to come. The Russian government has kindly agreed to assist Norway. They will make sure your gas and oil production will be restarted. You're not going to tell me what to say to Norwegian people. Come on, yes. You're not going to risk peaceful collaboration. She's not here. She's not going to open. I told you specifically not to provoke the Russians. Yes, yeah. things have changed now. Premieres Thursday, May 5th on Pivot. So. Occupy has received immense critical acclaim, and the second premiere of the show actually debuted this past spring. It took almost two years for the production of the second series to happen, primarily because of cost um, and also issues of geopolitical uh, <laughs> relevance. Uh, so, the series. Um, has been well received in its second season, not as well received as the first. Especially given the landscape with Russia currently and the tension actually between Norway and Russia at the time, at this point, over the politics in the Arctic, uh, it is, Norway has been cautious about how it proceeds with this story. So for a few last thoughts before hopefully we can get into a little discussion about TV. Netflix, first and foremost, has become an incredibly important platform for the dissemination of Norwegian TV and Norwegian cultural products. Um, the decentralized authority and the, access and the accessibility afforded by this platform have a wide enough breadth to reach audiences across the globe. Now, the three series I've talked about today are not exhaustive of all the other, all series, Norwegian series that are available on Netflix, and there are a few other recommendations if you would like any. Secondly, these shows on Netflix, whether focused on the past, the present, or the future, 
raise questions about cultural sustainability, whether questions about war and peace or the interaction between cultures. These shows mentioned today take up this theme as a way to explore the challenges of national, international, and global production and especially those questions in relationship to national identity. And so to end today, I would be amiss if I did not bring up what is the most popular show in Norway currently, and especially to bring it up in relationship to its connection to the United States. Two years ago, a television show named Skong premiered in Norway, or has, as it's been translated into English, Shame. This was a multi-platform show. What does that mean? It means that it utilized Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat as a way to tell the story, as well as regular production of episodes, traditional episodes. The show follows the lives of contemporary Norwegian teenagers as they try to navigate the, the tensions of teenage life. The show is shot in a somewhat reality TV format, which mirrors kind of the real world MTV style of the 90s and the 2000s. The cult following that this show has engendered is enormous. You can actually go to Oslo now and go on a SCOM tour where they take you to the high school and out to the spots in outside of the cafes, everything around Oslo where the characters are, uh, where the characters have been known to be. The show relied on multi-platform to tell extensions of every episode. So for example, you'd watch the 20 minute episode and if you wanted to find out more about Isak, you would log on to Instagram and Isak would have published a story that would have been an extension of what you saw um, during the regular viewing. Two weeks ago, I premiered this show in my intermediate language class, Norwegian language class at Luther College. And that show, um, or the, the class happens at 8 a.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah, which is a wonderful time. And, uh, and so about 40 minutes in on a Friday, I realized my students needed a little pick-me-up. So I turned on some SCOM to see what they would think, partially as a cultural product, of course, um, to get them to use their language, and um, just to explore something different than the grammar lesson that I had originally planned. When I previewed the show, I sent them out at 9 a.m. and I got a text from one of my students 10 minutes later that said, how do you access this show? sent him the web address, and um, six hours later, he sent me another text that said, I haven't stopped watching. Uh, he spent nine hours that day watching SCOM. Um, I am not sure if he had other classes, and I don't really want to know. But uh, it strikes, in that anecdote, it seems that this show strikes a sense of familiarity with uh, adolescents in this country. They've tried to translate this success and bring this format into the United States into the American context. And so uh, four months ago, SCOM Austin, so Shame Austin debuted, that has intended to follow the lives of nine youth in Austin, Texas, and follow their life stories. Using the same format, multimodal uh, interaction with narrative, and it is flopped. <laughs> so why is that format Norwegian? I don't know. Or is it just the youth that were selected? Is it Austin, Texas? I don't know. Um, but it's an interesting question to explore. So Norwegians are trying to use different modes, different ways of storytelling as a way to approach this idea of cultural sustainability. So as you may, as you venture from this today and as we descend onto our other locations, I hope that these observations and reflections and ideas provide some new shows for binge watching, perhaps. Um, or questions for further conversation about the way that we interact with media and interact with global media today. Thank you for your time. Thanks for being here. I think we have some time for questions and comments if anybody has any at this point. Yeah, that was I've got a question about uh, TV exposure. Yes. In, uh, southern uh, Scandinavia. Yeah. We have, uh, reception for European TV channels, and do they receive Nordic broadcasts? Uh, that is all based on, so in Norway, no, they would not receive European channels unless they subscribe to um, satellite dishes. Okay, but it's available. It's available, yep, yep, but it would not be, 
So every Norwegian citizen pays a TV tax. If you have a TV in your house, you pay a TV tax. And that gets you access to the basic seven or eight networks. So it's similar to just plugging in our cable in the United States in that regard. Um, but if you're going to have any sort of other broad breath, broad breath um, network coverage, it has to be satellite. So this goes the other way too then? If they, if they elect, the yeah. If they elect to pick up those Denmark, instance, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Swedes, um, the Swedish television, the national television network in Sweden is actually SVT. Um, Sveriges uh, television is actually available in Norway um, pretty regularly and pretty easily accessible. Most cable packages actually include Swedish TV, but it doesn't go the other way. So. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love it. <laughs> is it somewhat critical of the cycle of bureaucracy Absolutely. in Norway? Absolutely. And yeah. It's rugged American individualist to see it efficacious in a way that when he's not necessarily good all the time. No. No. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's an incredible critique of the, the national bureaucracy in the show. I mean, every time that he. You know, as an immigrant to the country, he's required to attend certain classes to learn how to be Norwegian, and he's horrible at those. His Norwegian language is just atrocious. He doesn't even try. But it signals the kind of control and the constraint that is put on people coming in as immigrants, but also as a direct critique of the um, lack of free market capitalism <laughs> and regulation that happens in the economic system in Norway. Uh, I, this show, I think that show is just Fascinating, and I, someday when I have time, I want to write a book about it. Um, but I got a hundred. I've got seventy-five students right now, so that's not going to happen this semester. Um, and uh, partially because of Van Zandt's obsession with Norway, and that's continued. So he's actually still continuing his relationship with Lillehammer Norway, and he started a whole. He wants to create Lillehammer Norway to be a epicenter of TV drama production. So now there's a whole TV drama week in Lillehammer, Norway, which Lillehammer, it takes two and a half hours by train from Oslo. That's the only way you get there. It's not easily accessible. I think it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. And also, uh, immigrants, no, I can remember, I guess, African immigrants. Yeah. Uh, immigration, as with all of Europe currently, is uh, such a huge question and an issue. Um, the Sweden has notor has always been the most liberal and open, has most had the um, most open border policy. Sweden is extremely shrink shrinking the accessibility of immigration to, to Sweden at the moment. Uh, Norway has been very intentional about immigration. They've taken a very active approach in that if you come to Norway seeking asylum or refugee um, or a refugee status, you are actually placed in a community somewhere in and around Norway. That means you can uh, grow up in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and be placed in northern Norway, where for three months a year you do not see daylight. Uh, the requirement is that you are there then for five years. They, because it is so bureaucratic, because there is so much structure, you're given a job. So it's not a question of just plopping you there and then expecting you to figure out life. Um, there are safety nets. Um, but this was in a policy to attempt to not get, for lack of a better word, it is an attempt in a, against ghettoization of certain parts of Norway. And ghettoization arguably has happened in Stockholm and has happened in Sweden, kind of in the southern part of Sweden. So this was an attempt to not do that. It hasn't been successful. <laughs> After five years, they all move. Um, Norway was actually during the height of the immigration uh, and migration movements three years ago was actually paying people to leave Norway because they didn't want to take responsibility. So if you were coming from Greece or from Turkey, they would give you a check to leave. It doesn't, yeah. So um, the immigration question is, is really challenging at the moment, especially because arguably Norway has the resources to take care of people. So is there a humanitarian responsibility 
associated with the money. There are in, in very intense and high regulations on any sort of censorship on TV. So um, the, the states, the Norwegian government owns TV. They own the primary broadcasting network and every, the three, um, three subsidiaries, like the, the, what we would consider like the PBS and um, the news station, the all time, the closest CNN that they have in Norway. Um, and so in terms of regulations, the Norwegian government has been in and has been very active since the 1950s in ensuring that they have a state policy towards television. So for example, market um, advertisements, you will get uh, television shows for 22 minutes and then you get seven minutes of advertisement. And that's how it goes. So you, will not, you always watch an episode of TV all the way through before you get the advertisement. They don't want people, they want people to know when advertisement will be happening. So if they want to turn off the TV and not be influenced by market advertising, <laughs> yeah, that you have the option to do that. So um, the regulation is very, very different than here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much.